Great, thank you. Um, glad to see you all out tonight and glad you could make it here. So uh, I'm at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the Department of Oceanography. Uh, been there about 17 years now, uh, studying marine plankton and my main area of expertise is on viruses in the ocean, or marine viruses and how they influence uh, marine life, in particular the plankton, which will be the main topic of uh, today. A little slow. One more time. There we go. So we are going to be talking about viruses, which isn't the usual thing you think about when you think about plankton. Uh, but viruses are all over this planet. Anywhere you see life, you're going to find viruses there as well. And <clears throat> I want to give just a brief uh, introduction to viruses to get us all on the same page before we start talking about viruses in the ocean. So what are they? Um, these are infectious agents that can only replicate by co-opting, getting inside of a cell, co-opting the machinery of the cell and using that to make copies of themselves. Uh, because they are not cells themselves, which all other life is made from, everything from bacteria to whales to us, it's all based on the cell as a fundamental unit. And viruses are not cells. <clears throat> they don't have their own metabolism. Um, they are essentially like uh, molecular symbionts, as we'll see. So they're really quite simple. They do replicate, but not like cells do. Uh, and in order to do that replication, they have a genome. Uh, but the different thing between viruses and all other living things is that genome doesn't have to be double-stranded DNA like uh, all living things. It can also be single-stranded DNA. It can also be made out of RNA, double or single-stranded. <clears throat> so they're very diverse in that regard. Uh, so essentially, it's the set of instructions, uh, the genome, which is wrapped up in a protein coat, which helps protect those instructions from degradation in the environment while that virus is outside of a host cell uh, waiting to encounter an appropriate cell to get inside of. When they are outside of a cell, we call that virus a virion. The virus particle is a virion. They don't do anything. They're essentially just protein DNA complex organic particles floating around or sitting on surfaces. Uh, the only thing, time something happens is if it bumps into the appropriate host cell. <clears throat> this is just a uh, electron micrograph of one particular virus. This virus happens to infect salmonella, the bacterium that causes uh, a human gastrointestinal illness. <clears throat> so even bacteria get infected by viruses. Now, they are very uh, diverse. Uh, this is just some uh, uh, illustration of some of the different morphotypes or morphological types of viruses that you can find. They can be um, um, often icosahedral heads, these capsids inside of which is packed the genome. They can have these sort of geometric shapes, but you'll see down here this long filamentous one. Sometimes that genome is just a long thread with uh, a helical tube of protein wrapped around it to protect it. And they, others have very uh, odd shapes like these bottle shaped ones down here and these lemon shaped ones that infect <clears throat> archaea. And they vary tremendously in size as you can see here, uh, E in this diagram versus D, uh, one of the larger viruses we know about. So these are just a few examples. Uh, and these are examples of viruses that infect a wide variety of different uh, living things. And every living thing on this planet is subject to viral infections. And we know just our species, humans, we have hundreds of different viruses capable of infecting us, exploiting our cells' resources to make copies of themselves. And in the process of doing so, they can cause illness, sometimes very severe, uh, including death. But a lot of viruses, through a long period of co-evolution, uh, cause illness, but not very severe, like the common cold, not so bad. These are just showing viral diversity again in terms of what they look like. These are uh, 
instead of drawings, these are actually uh, electron micrographs. So what they look like in the electron microscope, uh, which is required to see them because most of them are quite small. Now I mentioned how they are fundamentally different from things that we consider living. All things, living things are based on cells. How do cells grow uh, and divide and replicate? Well, a cell is a living thing. It has metabolism. It acquires material and energy from the environment that allows it to get bigger and then split into two daughter cells. And that's how all living things grow and how populations grow. It's cell division. As I mentioned, virus is completely different. Here, the virus has to encounter a host cell and get its nucleic acid inside or its genome inside a cell. In the process of doing that, the virus or the virion, the virus as a particle ceases to exist. That never happens with a cell. A cell is always there. It gets bigger. It splits into two. But you always have a cell. Uh, here, the virus, essentially the virion, ceases to exist. It's just the genome inside of the cell. And rather than a virus dividing like all cells do, it uses the host cell machinery to make all the precursors that are needed to build a new virus, creates all the parts, and then they get assembled. So it's a fundamentally different replication process. Uh, there are different modes of infection, though. Um, so that looks like uh, enemies, our enemies in this particular case. And here I'm showing this, what we call the lytics cycle. And this is an example of when viruses are the enemy of a cell. You've got the virus that attaches, the genome gets inside, the virus makes copies of itself, and the last thing it does is rupture the cell to release these progeny virus out into the wild where they can encounter a new host. So that's not so good for a cell. But viruses do other things. There's a state known as lysogeny, where the viral genome will get inside of a cell, and instead of making copies of itself and breaking free of the cell and killing the cell in the process, it simply becomes part of the cell. Its genome merges with the genome of the cell, creating essentially a genetically new different kind of cell because it's not the same cell it was. It had this genome, now it's that genome plus the viral genome. Uh, this is a reversible process in many cases. We call that viral genome inside the host genome a provirus. Uh, and this cell can continue on, grow, divide, replicate, and the viral genome just gets carried along. Uh, but if the cell becomes stressed, uh, most of these proviruses have a mechanism to sense that cell stress and abandon ship. Say, okay, this cell is in trouble. So it induces and then goes through the lytic cycle. Uh, and this makes sense. There are molecular mechanisms by which the virus keeps itself integrated as part of the host. It can sense molecularly when that cell is under stress and say, you know, the decision is essentially this cell is in trouble better make more copies, get out, and take chances of finding another host to uh, infect. So we have these two modes. And in this case, it's rather benign then. And in fact, it's, it's better than that. Uh, viruses can also be essentially are genetic engineers. In this process of lysogeny, we see, because of this intimate interaction between a viral genome and the host genome, uh, we have as I mentioned, this is, a, this is now fundamentally a genetically different type of cell than it was before infection. And that viral genome, very often in these cases, many, many examples we see where that viral genome inside the host cell actually codes for genes that gives that cell selective advantages. They can code for antibiotic resistance. They can provide immunity to infection by other closely related viruses. They can... Uh, uh, change the cell wall properties. Uh, they can allow that bacterium now to produce toxins. So this, we call this conversion of the cell, this lysogenic conversion where the infection with a virus actually changes the capabilities of that could cell. Be good or bad. Could be good or bad. So that's one example. Uh, another thing that can happen in viral infection is as the virus gets in and is replicating itself, making new copies of its genome and assembling new particles, 
Um, what I've shown in red here, uh, here the viral genome goes in, uh, and his thicker color, what I've shown here, is that sometimes the host genome, as the cell uh, virus is going through the replication cycle, the host DNA gets broken down. And sometimes big chunks of the host DNA gets put inside of a viral capsid rather than the viral genome. So I'm showing in red here an example of a virus that got in, packaged, not another viral genome, but a part of the host genome, and then exited the cell. Now, if that virus happens to then encounter another cell, it's instead of putting a viral genome in, it's going to introduce a piece of DNA from another cell. We call that process uh, transduction. So we see the host-derived DNA uh, after that infection can then be incorporated into the genome and that's the transfer of genes now, not just from a virus to a cell, but the virus acting as a shuttle to take DNA from one cell and put it into another cell. So this is a very common process as well and is one of the mechanisms by which genetic diversity occurs uh, among cells on which uh, natural selection can then act. Um, right. So I say they're not just genetic engineers, but given these two modes of how they replicate with cells, how they interact with cells, I like to think of viruses as essentially mo you know, symbiosis. You hear about symbiosis. That's the living together in close proximity for a prolonged period of two different species. Well, in this case, the virus isn't really another cell. It's sort of this uh, replicon molecular thing. So I call them molecular symbionts. Um, where they can have two modes of interaction. Symbiosis can range from the bad, parasitism, which is what we see in the lytic cycle, uh, to the good, where you have mutually benefit, beneficial relationships. Uh, and that can be these cases of, for instance, lysogenic conversion and transduction, where if that resident viral genome is providing a benefit to the cell, which in many cases we know it does, then you've got this beautiful symbiotic relationship, a mutualistic relationship. But we do know of cases of viruses that get into cells and aren't really helping at all. An example of that would be the, in the humans, would be a herpes virus, which gets in and resides and re quiescent inside of cells, but under stress, uh, it can erupt and cause sores. So we don't think we get any real benefit from herpes virus infections. Uh, so that's a case where it would still be a parasitism, even though it's a prolonged relationship. So infection. Here's another example of a viral infection. Uh, this is the enemy's side of it. This is a green turtle uh, herpes virus. It causes these terrible lesions on green turtles, green sea turtles. So it can be lethal and ugly, which led one Nobel Prize winner uh, to quip that viruses are nothing more than a piece of bad news wrapped in protein. So that's one way to define a virus. So can they get those tumor things on their shell as well or just on their stomach? Uh, seems to be, I have not seen it on the shell. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, so this is the bad side, clearly the enemy side of it. But I don't like to dwell on this side of it too much because I study viruses for a living and I love them. <laughs> and I want you to love them too. So I want you to see the other side. So yes, infection can be lethal and ugly, but can it be beautiful? Maybe. Here's an example of a viral infection of a tulip this color breaking or variegation of tulips is actually caused uh, by the tulip mosaic virus. This is one of those cases where the virus gets inside and inserts itself into the genome of, in this case, the tulip, and interrupts the gene in certain cells that are responsible for producing the color. And so you get these striped patterns wherever the virus has infected the tissue. And you get these really beautiful. So this is a painting by a Dutch painter uh, 1722. And, you know, I'm calling it beautiful, but beauty, ah, 
so subjective. <laughs> is it really beautiful? Well, I would argue it is. Listen to this. We can quantify how beautiful this flower is. Because this is an inventory of the goods that somebody paid to get one bulb of a tulip that looks like this. And this was in 1625 in Holland during the tulip mania, one of the first financial uh, bubbles that we know about. Everybody going crazy for tulips and paying crazy sums for something. So this is what somebody paid for one bulb. Four tons of wheat, eight tons of rye, four fat oxen, eight fat pigs, 12 fat sheep, two hogsheads of wine, four barrels of beer, two barrels of butter, 1,000 pounds of cheese, one bed with the accessories, one full dress suit, and one silver goblet. Now that is one pretty flower. All thanks to a virus. So aren't they great? Love viruses. And if that wasn't good enough for you, maybe you don't like flowers. Well, do you like being human? <laughs> So this is the title of an essay. Can viruses make us human? Uh, and this is an essay by Louis P. Villarreal in 2004. Uh, and he goes through a long argument talking about uh, these things I mentioned before, viruses as genetic engineers. And you look at the difference between humans and their closest relatives, <clears throat> and you see a big part of that difference is because of ancient viral infections retroviruses that incorporated into the human genome cause changes to the DNA and gene expression. And those retro old infection retroviruses that litter our genome are essentially partly responsible for making us the way we are. So maybe you don't enjoy being him, but if you find other humans attractive, <laughs> thank a virus. So yes. Okay, so let's go to the ocean now. So introducing the key players in the marine food web, uh, comparing it to the terrestrial world, we're not in the ocean yet, uh, we have forests and grasslands. And yes, we have similar types of biomes in the ocean. We have kelp forests and we have sea grasses. But these are incredibly important uh, habitats, but you only find them near shore and they contribute very, very little to the total productivity of the ocean. Crucial habitat for a lot of species, but in terms of the overall productivity and how much production gets done and how much life in the ocean gets fed, these contribute very, very little. What's actually doing it uh, are the phytoplankton. The plants of the sea which are microscopic. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the scale we're talking about. You know phytoplankton are small. Well, how small are they? Well, let's take a look. So for scale, what I'm showing here is a scanning electron micrograph uh, in the background there, this, this big log-like thing in the background, that is a human hair, magnified, you got it. So human hair, the scale there, 50 microm micrometers. Uh, and what I want to do is superimpose on this picture of a human hair some approximate sizes of some of the more important phytoplankton out there. These are the ones we consider the big phytoplankton. Uh, diatoms, coccolithophores, shrinking down there, and dinoflagellates. These are some of the giants, and they're about the width of a human hair. Uh, there's a general rule of thumb that the smaller something is, the more of it there is. And that's true here. So there are much smaller phytoplankton, lots and lots of different kinds of flagellates out there that are even more abundant and even more important in terms of the primary productivity in the ocean. And most abundant of all, and producing most, doing most of the photosynthesis are even smaller things. These are photosynthetic bacteria called cyanobacteria. So there they are for scale. Um, and what about abundance? So you go down and scoop up a liter of water with your water bottle and take a look. What do you see? Not very much. Uh, if you look for these various things, like how many fish are you going to see? If you go down and scoops up some water in your water bottle, yeah, approximately none. 
The average liter of water has no fish in it. But it is not empty. It is not lifeless. You'll have these little crustaceans, tiny little millimeter-sized things swimming around feeding on algae. Maybe 10 in these waters, maybe fewer, 1 to 10. But the phytoplankton, which we just saw, are very, very small, too small, too small to see with the naked eye by holding this water up to the light. Uh, those you'll have about a million. The cyanobacteria, which are even smaller, much more abundant, uh, about 100 million. Then the decomposers, the bacteria out there, tiny little things, you'll have about a billion in every liter. And the viruses, my favorite, about 10 billion. So there are a lot of them out there in every drop of seawater. 10 billion in a liter of water. And we go swimming in that? We swimming in viruses. So this number is huge and I can't even wrap my head around what does 10 billion really look like? So I want to give you a sense of the abundance of viruses, their concentration. But to do it, 10 billion is too big of a number. So what I want to do is scale the volume down. Let's not talk about a liter. That's a lot of viruses. Let's scale it down to something more tractable. Let's talk about a microliter. That's one one millionth of a liter. Uh, on my finger, what I've done is I've cut out a little piece of plastic that's one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter. That is the defi definition of a microliter. So if I had a, if you go out and get a drop of water that size on you, maybe you don't like to swim even, you just go down, you're standing by the water, you say, oh, there are viruses, I don't want to go in that water. But of course, some kid comes running by and splashing in the water and gets a little drop on you, that size. What we're going to do is take a drop of water that size, stain it with a fluorescent DNA stain, so we, a shine blue light on it. So anything that's got DNA in it is going to fluoresce green. So we're going to stain it, squash it flat, and look under a high-powered fluorescence mic light microscope to see what's in that drop. How much stuff is it? All of that. It looks like the night sky. Yeah. As Louis Pasteur said. Uh, which, you know, where the telescope ends, the microscope begins. Which has the grander view? Uh, maybe that wasn't Pasteur. Who was that? Victor Hugo, I think it was. Never remember. So all the big green dots, the brightest big ones, are bacteria. The tiny little pinpricks of green that you see in the background are all the viruses. Oh, viruses. Yes. Uh, so that's how much is in every single drop. So life out there in the ocean, everything living and swimming out there in the ocean is swimming through a soup of viruses at very high concentrations, relatively high concentrations. So we're just zooming in now uh, to a smaller patch here. And so the point I want to make about that is there, there are a lot out there. And you look at these cells, these happen to be bacteria, but the phytoplankton, if they were in this picture, would look much larger, probably fill the whole frame. But they're swimming through that same pool of uh, stuff. So every cell out there, to understand its ecology, I like to say you can't just think about it on its own because it's out there interacting constantly, bumping into, uh, fighting off infections from viruses. Dr. Stewart, yes? Is what you said about the, the uh, distribution of the viruses applying to fresh water and salt water likewise? Yes, it, it does. They are in uh, lakes, streams. The, the absolute abundances are going to vary a lot. And it also depends on you know, how many exactly there are. It's also going to depend on whether you're talking close to shore or you're way out in the open ocean. They'll drop by you know, a factor of five fewer when you're way offshore. And as you go deeper in the ocean, because there's less productivity, there are fewer cells, you also get fewer viruses. Yeah, so they drop off dramatically by factors of 10, 100 as you go deeper in the ocean. Yeah, so it... But, but they are in all bodies of water, in the soil, aquifers, in the sediments, yeah. deep in the rocks of the earth. Is the ocean generally basic, right? Yes. And the fresh water is what, what is? 
highly variable, but some of them are very alkaline. Some can be acidic. I'm wondering if the virus like acidic or the basic. Uh, so, well, uh, it depends more on the productivity, I think. But I'll tell you that some of the most, some of the highest concentrations I have ever seen were in uh, an alkaline soda lake, uh, Mono Lake in California. Yeah. Super high. And some salt evaporator ponds, too, have very high concentrations of uh, viruses in them. So these cells are out there interacting. Uh, 10 to the 13, that's some huge number, one with 13 zeros after it. Contacts happening in a cubic meter. So that's a volume of water that's one meter, one meter by one meter, this big cube. 10 to the 13 times a virus is bumping into a cell every day. And over a billion of those contacts will turn into actual infections. So this is going on constantly. And every time you have an infection, you have a little genetic experiment going on. Uh, so it's very uh, dynamic. So I understand the ecology, but we have to know about the virosphere, this uh, total of viruses with which they're interacting and intimately contacting with exchanging genetic information. Okay, so the marine food web, um, we talked about those different types of phytoplankton here. I'm splitting them out, uh, diatoms, dinoflagellates, the little flagellates, and, which is a whole collection of, it's incredibly diverse, <clears throat> just classifying them with common names here. Together they can uh, consume as much carbon dioxide and produce as much oxygen as the plants on land every day. Uh, so the ocean is a big deal, balance of uh, gases on our planet and the air that we breathe. <clears throat> so where do all these phytoplankton go? Well, a lot of them get grazed. They'll get eaten by those little copepods and then eaten by bigger things and then bigger things still through this food chain. But that's only for the really big phytoplankton. Most of the phytoplankton are much, much smaller. So the main grazers on those are other single-celled organisms, not even animals, but other things that don't photosynthesize, that swim around and eat these little phytoplankton. But then they're a little bigger now, so those then can be eaten by uh, other animals. Now, the entire food web out there, you can imagine with all these infections going on, not to mention the fact that the ocean is full of animals and everything poops. <laughs> All those animals, the tiny little crustaceans, to the fish and the whales, they're all pooping. The ocean is a cesspool. <laughs> but, so, it's constantly leaking out organic material, dead cells, detritus, dissolved organics from broken, dead, and lost cells spilling out. So that feeds into what we call the dissolved organics and detritus pool. And most of the organic carbon in the ocean is in this pool. It's not in the cells. And the fish, it's dissolved. And pretty much the only thing eating this enormous pool of carbon out there are the bacteria, the decomposers. So yes, the ocean is for all that marine life, but the bacteria, the decomposers are out there cleaning it up constantly. So they consume that organic matter and they in turn now become food for the microzooplankton. So that's great, but what about viruses? Where do they fit in here? Well, I've collapsed those phytoplankton back into one little cluster over there on the left, the primary producers um, and the grazers and the carnivores. So now I wanna show if we, you know, we didn't even know, when I started graduate school in 1989, we didn't really think much about viruses in terms of how we thought the ocean worked. People knew, had done experiments and showed, yeah, there are some out there, but nobody had any idea how many. With the first direct counts, and showing what we know now is huge numbers. That's when this field of uh, marine virology really took off. Uh, and so when we start incorporating that into our model, conceptual model of how this works, what you'll see is that when you've got viral lysis killing the phytoplankton, that's taking food away. You lose phytoplankton and what do you turn it into? Well, now it's no longer food for the grazers. It has become food for the bacteria. So the viruses essentially are competing with the grazers for this resource, the phytoplankton. Um, as a consequence, if when you have viruses there versus when we didn't know they were there, uh, that reduces, uh, 
Not to mention the fact that viruses are lysing everything out there. So the act of having viral lysis acting on this grazing food chain, it means a larger portion of the organic carbon in the ocean is being shunted into this dissolved pool and being fed to the bacteria rather than producing more fish. So this changes quantitatively how you model the system. So viruses basically were, I guess we're competing with them too. Uh, if there were no viruses, we potentially have more fish in the ocean. So the bacteria basically are favored at the expense because of this shunting of organic carbon into the dissolved pool. Uh, but again, they also become then food for other grazers once they consume that organic matter. But even the bacteria get infected. So everything out there being lysed, that's part of the process by which all this dissolved material forms in the ocean that feeds the bacteria. Okay, so why do we study viruses uh, in my lab? Uh, because they make things happen. Everything susceptible to virus infections. They're everywhere. They're very abundant. They're driving evolutionary changes. They're changing the physiology of cells. Uh, and they're a major source of plankton mortality. So um, my lab and the uh, lab of Kyle Edwards at UH, are, we're both uh, collaborating, studying viral ecology, and we study viruses infecting all types of life, but what I'm gonna focus on today are those that infect phytoplankton specifically. And I'll show you an overview of our collection and then just give you a couple examples of two of the cool phytoplankton viruses we've isolated recently. Oh, and I have to point out that this effort of what I'm about to talk about next in, involves a huge amount of work of cultivation, painstakingly isolating phytoplankton out of the ocean, uh, isolating viruses that are capable of infecting them, and then, once, and then characterizing them. And the hard part is once you get them, you got to maintain them. Otherwise, they'll die. So you got to keep growing and transferring and infecting to keep the cells and the viruses going in culture. And this is all the very hard work of a graduate student who's now a postdoc with me, Chris Schwartz. So I want to acknowledge this huge effort that he has done to produce what I'm about to show you. So we are focused on the eukaryotic or the bigger marine phytoplankton and the viruses that infect them. I'm talking about diatoms, dinoflagellates, coccolithophores, and all sorts of tiny little flagellates. Enormous diversity out there millions of species, over 450 genera of different kinds of plankton out there living and growing and dying. Uh, and so far, there are only about 10 of these many genera for which viruses had been isolated and characterized. Um, and all of them were coastal species. But most of the ocean is open ocean and there are different things living out there. So our goal then was to get more examples of the kinds of viruses that are most abundant in our oceans. So our sampling sites and areas we worked, one, we did do some coastal work, that's Kaneohe Bay. And we also went to Station Aloha. This is a site that's visited approximately monthly by uh, the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program. It's been going on for over 30 years, going out to the same spot in the ocean, making measurements. So we sampled out in the open ocean there as well. Um, our goals were, as I mentioned, to isolate better representative phytoplankton and viruses from the open ocean. And we're particularly interested in these so-called giant viruses. Viruses we tend to think of as very, very small things. And there's a reason that's because they have to replicate inside of another cell. So they can't be too big. They can't be bigger than the cell. Uh, but there are these things called giant viruses that infect large phytoplankton. The reason we were interested in them because a big genome means lots of genes, which means the opportunity to discover things that we haven't seen before. But we isolated a whole different spectrum. So when I say giant virus, this is an example of what most of the marine viruses we know about look like, um, from very small on the far edge to rather large phytoplankton infecting ones, and a lot of bacteria infecting ones that mainly, mostly have these tail appendages on them. But the giants are more in that size range for perspective. All right, so here's a little uh, summary of what Chris was able to isolate. Uh, these names 
not so important. The important thing is you can see the little cartoon pictures. It's just to give you a sense of the diversity of different kinds of things he was able to get in culture, where they came from. We got a lot from Kaneohe Bay. We got a lot from Station Aloha. And we found viruses um, infecting a lot of these very diverse kinds of phytoplankton. And we had a lot of firsts. Um, for a lot of these genera, so like Cylindrothecum, and Amphiprora, this was the first time a virus had ever been isolated in these. Um, even at larger taxonomic group levels, the Dictyocophytes, nobody had ever isolated a, a virus infecting a Dictyocophyte before. So we got that. And then even at the kingdom level, one of the viruses we found infects uh, Chlorarachniophytes which are in the kingdom Rhizaria, which is a huge major group of the eukaryotes and that entire spectrum, there had never been a virus isolated before. So he was able to pull out some really interesting things. This is just a quick overview of what the, the ones we've characterized most closely look like in the electron micrograph over on the right, some very large to very, very small down in the lower right. Uh, and in fact, this collection includes the largest and the smallest known phytoplankton viruses um, and all sorts of different genome types from double-stranded DNA, which we'll highlight in blue. Some of them had single-stranded DNA genomes in green. Uh, we'll highlight uh, in purple the double-stranded RNA and then in red, single-stranded RNA. So we had every possible variation, so really nice collection. Now, I just want to give you a taste of two of the bigger viruses uh, because they have some interesting properties. So that's Tetraselmus virus and a Florenziella virus. Tetraselmus virus, we call it TETV. This is what the host cell looks like. If you remember, human hair is variable, but we'll say about 50 micron in width. This scale bar is 10 microns, so about one fifth of the width of a human hair. And this cell is smaller than that. Uh, it's got four flagella, which you can just make out here. It's uh, green, makes a nice green culture. Um, and this is a section taken through a cell after it's been infected. We sliced it very thinly so you can see inside the cell. And what you can see that arrow head up there is pointing to is one of the virions that's accumulating inside the cell as it replicates. But there are a whole bunch more here. So this cell is doomed. Well, it was doomed, and then we doomed it more by collecting it and fixing it and slicing it, but it was going to die anyway. Uh, and that's what the isolated, the virion outside of the cell looks like in the electron microscope. Okay, so Tetracelmus is interesting because uh, it very commonly forms in a lot of places very intense blooms where it actually turns the water really bright green. And this is just some of the examples where these blooms have been reported, including right here, Oahu at Waimanalo Bay. Uh, this is, I believe, from uh, Valparaiso, Chile, the green water. And these are photos uh, from Waimanalo Bay. And you tend to get these blooms after heavy rains. You get freshwater runoff and nutrients coming into the water. Turns the water very green, very dense. You'll see somebody's hand there. It's so murky, you can't even see their hand. <laughs> So they make very dense blooms. So if you take the genome of an average size virus and it looks like this, this TETV is kind of a monster. It's like that size. Uh, and we looked at all the genes and what they're doing on there and found all this stuff, which isn't going to mean anything. Like, so yeah, so what? So I'm just going to point out, wow, what we found surprised us. Two of these genes are involved in fermentation, which we know about fermentation. Well, that's how you make uh, sauerkraut and kimchi, beer wine. It's a way a cell gets energy in the absence of oxygen. So it ferments. It can produce acetic acid or uh, uh, alcohol. Right. So we found these genes involved in the fermentation process inside of a virus. Think, wow. So this has never been seen before. So that was really interesting. So what is it doing? We think it's because these algae produce these blooms that are so intense. During the day, those algae are producing oxygen. But at nighttime, there are so many cells and dying cells that the bacteria and the algae are all respiring and sucking up the oxygen. And you run out of oxygen at nighttime. And we think this virus then has this adaptation to be able to get energy and spread through the bloom even during the nighttime when the oxygen is depleted. 
Um, so that's really an interesting observation. It was very new. Are there any practical applications? Um, Sure. Well, one of my colleagues tweeted after we published this paper, the virus with fermentation genes, and it's like, yeah, but can they make beer from it? So maybe <laughs> we should try to clone those genes into a yeast and make some giant virus pale ale. That would be cool. But more seriously, we actually have been contacted by folks from the Department of Energy who are working on an algal biofuels project who are requested our virus and host to try to genetically engineer tetracelmus to be able to produce uh, lipids and for biofuels. So it may have some practical applications. All right, the last then and second, second and last example is the Florenziella virus. So this is a micrograph of the host there. It's got two flagella. What's cool about this thing is it's a phytoplankton, which means it photosynthesizes, but it's also a predator. It swims around and eats other cells. So it's a plant that eats other things. Say, like, that's weird. I never heard of that. Oh, wait, yes, I have. Yes. <laughs> so we call this mode of nutrition, which turns out to be very common in the ocean. A lot of the phytoplankton out there, like this guy, are photosynthetic, uh, photosynthesizing, making carbon, but they're also swimming around and eating things. You say, well, why? In God's name, why would they do that? Why can't you just be happy to be a plant? Well, the same reason a Venus flytrap does it. A Venus flytrap doesn't eat flies because it needs carbon or protein. Uh, what it's after is the nutrients. You find them in nutrient poor soils. And where do you find these guys? Nutrient poor ocean waters where there's not enough nitrate, phosphate. Concentrations are very low. They can't compete for it with the small cyanobacteria. So instead of trying to get the nitrate phosphate before they do, they let them get it and then they eat them. Shake them down for their lunch money. So mixotrophy is very common. So this particular virus, exceptionally even cool, cooler, I think, because it's even bigger. So here is some scanning electron micrograph of the Florenciella. That's the, the round bodied cell right here. And then you see one flagellum going up here and another one here. All around it, these little sausage like things are bacteria, the decomposers cleaning up the ocean for us. This is a culture that we infected with this virus. And then you wait, we zoomed in here on it. And then after a while, oh, that's not good. You see these giant icosahedral geometric shapes that have accumulated. And now this cell is splitting apart. These viruses are spilling out into the water. Uh, so you see the, the demise of this particular cell. And, you know, I said that Tet V genome was big, but now here's the Florenciella virus genome next to that, and it's even bigger. It's huge. It's as big as a lot of the bacterial, the genomes of cells that live out there in the ocean. This is just to show how interesting this genome is. This is a metabolic map, which you can't read. It doesn't matter. The point, point is that all metabolic functions we know about that cells do, we can map them out, and it's very faint in the background. But the point is, every dot is a product, uh, and bridging them, there's an enzyme that converts this carbon uh, uh, molecule into this one. And it's a complex web of things that cells do. Viruses tend to have very, very few of these things. But this one was interesting. What we see in red, oh, sorry. Ooh. What happened? How do I go back? There we go. Uh, in red uh, are genes, enzymes that, genes for enzymes that we've seen in this virus and in other viruses, but in blue are all things that have never been seen in a virus before. And it does a lot of different things, a lot of different things. But I want to just highlight a couple of that I think are the, the most interesting. So many things never before seen in a virus, but what really caught my eye is it produces, it's got genes for producing the same types of lipids and sugars that bacteria have on their surface. So that was weird. How did it get those genes? And why does this virus have them? Um, 
So that comes back to this uh, related question of why be big? We got these giant viruses. What's so great about being so big? Uh, here's the most common size virus you can see is that if that's the most common size and a giant relative to it would be that size. You can see disadvantages of being big because a virus has to replicate inside of a cell. So if you're replicating inside of a cell and you're small, you can make a lot more virus versus being big and you can only make a handful. Uh, so more progeny per infection. So the birth size is bigger. They're smaller, they can diffuse around. They can't swim, so they rely on diffusion. If you're smaller, you diffuse faster, so potentially a small virus could diffuse better. And being very small makes it hard for grazers to eat them, so they can survive out in the wild for a while. So that's all things good about being small, so why be giant? Uh, well, some of the benefits could be this giant genome means that this virus is more independent. When it gets inside of the host cell, it can basically shut the host cell down and take over. And we believe that allows it to infect more different kinds of cells. And if you're not relying on finding just that special one, but you can infect any of a number of different, then you have greater chances of causing an infection. The other is we think these things are actually trying to get eaten. They're right up in that size range that there are all these grazers out there that eat bacteria for a living. And these are bacteria size. And they produce these same sugars that bacteria produce. So our hypothesis is that these giant viruses, there's this drive for them to get up into that size range because that is how they get inside the cell. This is the trick they use to get in. Most viruses require a very specific lock and key type mechanism between two different proteins to recognize each other and then get in. All the host has to do is change that protein and suddenly the virus is locked out. These guys, by masquerading as food, you can't get around that. These cells need to eat. How do you avoid them? So we think it's a Trojan horse strategy where you've got the cell, it's eating Prochlorococcus, these cyanobacteria, other bacteria, and then you've got the virus that is big and coated with bacteria-like surface properties, uh, and that's how it gets in. So we call this, uh, was it something I ate? So I'm showing here in green the prochlorococcus, and then here, mixed in with the food, the giant virus. All's good until you eat the wrong thing, and then not so good. <laughs> And then you spread that infection to the next guy. All right. So in conclusion, uh, the viruses, I find them absolutely fascinating. They're incredibly diverse in both their shape, size, and genome type. They do have major influence on all sorts of processes out there in the ocean, affecting evolution, the ecology of life in the ocean. Uh, and they are this interesting, huge very poorly explored so far. We're just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many viruses out there, as we just saw, every drop. Millions of different kinds of viruses out there. Uh, some of these huge ones with all sorts of different genes on them that we, you know, when we go to annotate these genomes, I showed you some of the cool genes we found. But what I didn't tell you is most of them, we have no idea what they do. So there are lots of cool stories for the ones we know about, and there are probably more cool stories to be discovered once we start figuring out what these other genes do. Uh, so because they are specifically adapted to manipulating cells, they also, as I indicated, have potential biotechnological applications as well. So that's my story. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Oh, my acknowledgments too for the, the group again, and uh, very important, our facility support from Seymour, the Dave Carl's the director, and from the National Science Foundation, which supplied the funding that allowed us to do all of this work. Very grateful that we have that source of funding. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, first was back here. Yeah, like that blue in Florida, and that house, was it a house? Right. Yes. Oh. 
Uh, those types of harmful algal blooms, uh, very common. And yeah, there's some evidence that they may be coming more common. Uh, so I'm trying to remember the spe specific bloom. This is a recent one. Do the peak like the swamps or something? I know there was two. There was the red and then there was the cyanobacteria. We're talking about a peak before. Oh, oh like a, yeah. Yeah. So just in general, yeah, I mean, I think we, I think there's some evidence that these types of harmful algal blooms, uh, they're relatively common, maybe becoming more common. Um, there has been interest uh, in the possibility of using viruses as a form of biocontrol. You know, you isolate a virus that infects that alga that's causing the problem. You know, these algae can grow to high densities. Not the Tetracelmus, but other species that grow to high densities can also produce toxins, cause massive fish kills and things like that. So for those cases where they are seriously harmful, you know, some thought, well, might we be able to isolate a virus that kills that? And then we see an incipient bloom forming and you go out and spray some mm -hmm. virus on the streets. You know, I think that's far from becoming a reality. And one of the caveats is that, you know, most of the time when we tried biocontrol it, hasn't worked out so well, um, but but it's a possibility. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I have a uh, meaning of a word. Early in the film, you, you had the virus and it synthesizes and assembles. Does yeah. the symbol have a special meaning? Synthesizes and assembles. No, I was actually struggling. Actually, right before this talk, I was working on those two words, trying to decide. So I saw what I had there, and I was like, is this the best way to describe it? So the assembly is just distinguishing it from just distinguishing it from the fact that cells always split into two. That's how cells grow and replicate. That's what you mean they can get bigger, assembly. and then they split. That's not assembly. What I'm saying for a so virus... It's more like uh, it's more li like the way that an uh, automobile gets made. You make a bunch of parts, and then you put the pieces together. But I thought the word synthesize meant that. Yeah, that's why I was struggling to find a better word. <laughs> I was changed it to co-opt and assemble and yeah. First of all, I must thank you for putting the diacritical marks on Kane Ohe. Oh, and yes. <laughs> yes. Because, you know, Hawaiian is a living language. Yes. And I thank you so much for doing that. Yes, thank I was you. very pleased to find that, you know, it's actually not that hard to do. You just need to download yeah. the, the Hawaiian keyboard and switch over and mm -hmm. makes it nice and easy. So. <laughs> yes. Oh. Oceans, it's it's warming oceans affect viruses and all the Warming oceans? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, just in the, in a general way that, the, you know, the, the warming is going to affect everything in all sorts of unpredictable ways. But, you know, you could start to think about, well, is there anything specific about warming that, you know, directly affects what viruses do? Um uh, well, one thing would be the decay rates. You know, we, temperature is a major factor. And how long this virion that's out there floating in the water, if it doesn't find a host cell, it's going to either get stuck on a particle and sink to the bottom, or enzymes will slowly chew away at it, or UV light is going to break down the DNA. It's got a limited lifespan, if we can call it life. Limited time before it gets into another host cell, before it becomes inactive. Uh, and the higher the temperatures, the faster that decay rate goes. The other thing where it could influence is temperature stress, because I talked about how a lot of cells out there have viruses integrated in them. And we know one way <clears throat> to scare them out, one stress you can put on a cell to see if it's harboring any viruses is temperature shock. <clears throat> so getting cells under stress, you know, could increase the induction, but the other thing is going to be is pH change <clears throat> from the carbon dioxide getting into water. Changing the acidity can influence the contact rates and the absorption rates between a virus and the host cell uh, because of charges on the surface. You change the pH, you change the charge balance, and that can influence the uh, uh, adsorption efficiency. 
So there are lots of little subtle things, but I think the main thing is that it's hard to predict. You could say, well, this might happen, but everything else is going to change so much that. Is most of the CO2 that's, I mean, is picked up by the ocean, right? That's the yeah, I think probably the about half of, yeah. And is that just passive diffusion or is it through the act of use? It's diffusion. <clears throat> but it's facilitated by what we call the biological pump or the plankton in the ocean, photosynthesizing, using the CO2 up that's in the surface water, turning it into organics, some of which then sink. And so now we've depleted the CO2 concentration in the surface water, which then facilitates the diffusion from the atmosphere into the ocean. So we keep diffusing it in, phytoplankton use it, some of that sinks, more comes in, they use it, it sinks. Are there ways, or people who get ways to make it happen quicker? I mean, is that a place? To well, that's a closer? big area of discussion as well, and controversy, of course. Uh, there have been all sorts of proposals uh, specifically to do that, to use the plankton in the ocean to stimulate their growth, to facilitate the uptake of carbon dioxide and burial in the deep ocean. Uh, so it's been looked into a lot, and the bottom line is people say, well, it's not tractable at this point. It has uncertain consequences. We talked about harmful algal blooms, for example, toxin-producing algae, um, and the efficiency of it. And the experiments that have been done, been done suggest that you can stimulate the blooms, but the amount of extra material that actually makes it all the way down deep enough to make a difference is it's pretty small. So it could be part of a solution, but there are a lot of caveats that go along with it. Great, we have one more question. Yeah, sorry, yes, yes. you can. Yeah, I was interested in sort of the climate change effect on viruses too. I was sort of looking at it in a little bit different point of view. Um, you know, the climate change effect is that you know, we have to take samples monthly of station of which I think was set up at the end of the 1980s or so. Yeah. But I'm not sure, did you uh, start taking uh, viral samples no. in the late 80s? Or when, when did you start? No, nope. very, very few people in the world change? knew, yeah. cared anything about viruses. And the there were maybe two people yeah. studying it uh, until the, well, actually, I take that back. I was right around then. <laughs> 1989 was his first paper that came out that showed wow, there are a lot of viruses, and that sort of launched the field. But we, what we were able to do at that point, because it was a new field, it was so primitive to what we can do now. So we don't have a lot. No, actually, there was, and there was no, no viral work being done at Station Aloha. When? When did you start? Oh, probably. I started in grad school, but I was in California for grad school. I came here in 2002, and have done stuff off and out on at Aloha and not the kind of routine monitoring that the Hawaii Ocean Time series does because there's no, there was no one specific informative thing that we could go out and measure every time and learn something important like carbon dioxide concentrations and pH that we have this beautiful time you go out and just measure pH. And it's a beautiful record and you can see pH going down yeah, out there. Yeah. Yeah. What I wish we had been doing since then, since the very beginning, was filtering on very small filters to catch viruses and archiving them. Uh, we didn't start doing that until, well, maybe about six years ago. I, there's Chris Schwartz, the same grad student who's been doing cultivation. He did a, he went out on every cruise for three years. Yeah. And so we have a three year record for the upper 175 meters out there of all the plankton including the viruses, all collected on a filter. And I'm in the process of trying to analyze those as, as my sabbatical uh, project.